Welcome back to Fixing Furniture. The project on my bench today is a small child's rocking chair that's been refinished and has been repaired. Unfortunately, the repair failed. Why? Because they were using the wrong tool for the job. Dowels are great tools for constructing furniture, but in a lot of cases, they can be misleading in terms of repairing furniture. I used to have a video on YouTube that I've since deleted that showed how to repair certain pieces of furniture with a dowel. I'll show you what a clip of that is, I'll show you the mistake that was made here, and most importantly, I'll show you the right way to repair furniture the first time. As a furniture repair business, we're opening the doors to our workshop to show you the tools and techniques to repair furniture. The front rail here, you can see this has been broken off. We give you tips to make your repair projects easier. Let's get into the workshop and start fixing furniture. Sponsored by Kennedy Hardware, offering restoration hardware for antique furniture. Let's start by taking a closer look at the chair. This chair is a great example of craftsmanship. I can tell these turnings were all done by hand because they're slightly different. There's some variations between them. The arm here, that's a little bit loose, so it needs some attention. The details on this back here are absolutely beautiful. It's got a bead around here that was hand carved, and then this area is recessed with a swan and a lily pad. And if I move this slightly in the light, you can see some of the details of the carving. You can see in the center of the seat here, there's a split. I don't know if I can repair that when I take it apart. We'll certainly take a look. I've noticed that the back on this chair is slightly loose, so this will have to be taken off and re-glued. The bottom here, this is loose, so it will have to come off and get re-glued. But the most important part of this repair is back here on this stretcher. You can see here this is broken off. This was bumped by the customer and it snapped. And that's because down here, let me see if I can pull this apart, the stretcher was repaired with a dowel. Now, I used to think this was an appropriate way to repair things, and I'll show you a video I created on that, but I've since taken off of YouTube. There's a critical flaw in using dowels to repair furniture like this. I'll show you why, and I'll show you a few more examples I've got here in the workshop of how things have broken because of this. But first, what I want to do is show you how to repair this rocking chair the right way. In here, I need to turn a new stretcher on the lathe. Now, when working on furniture repair and restoration, it's important to have the knowledge and understanding of the proper tools and techniques to repair furniture. In this case, I'm going to show you the beginner's steps of how to turn something on the lathe. So, if you're interested, you can do that. But it will also give you some perspective if you're seeking out a professional to help you repair something like this. You can find a wood turner and you know what to ask for. I'll start this work by disassembling everything. This should be pretty easy because everything is pretty loose. Before I take anything apart, I want to label the pieces. So I just go through and label them on the top here. And it's important when you've got a turning to make sure you put it in the exact same position when you put it back together again. There's typically worn spots where people put their feet. So this way with this label, when the glue's wet and I'm really in a hurry to put it together, I know exactly the way to orient it. When I've got a chair on the bench, I simply label these the way I see them, the left and the right. So this is my front left, this is my front right. Here, I'm just gonna label this the front right as well. I know that this is unique, so it's going to be the front one. So if I label this the front right as well, I know this one goes here, front left, and so on. I can now grab a clamp, change it to a spreader clamp, and pull this apart. I don't recommend using a mallet to take furniture apart. I've done it a number of times and I've snapped pieces. It's just not worth the risk. So by using a clamp like this, this one's really easy to pull apart. It's so loose, but you can see how it just lifts the pieces out and then I can take it apart. Now, if you've got a stubborn joint like this one, you just need to make sure these other ones are out and then just sort of wiggle it around in a circular motion, apply more pressure, and it'll come out. Okay, well that was, wow, these pieces are really loose. 
So the next part is to take the back off and they're, oh, there's supposed to be wedges in these cuts here. And what they do is the wedge expands the wood and prevents the back from wanting to pull out. But without wedges here, this should be easy to take apart. The arms here are held on with screws. So I just need to take the screw off first. And then I can put the spreader clamp on and then pop the back off. This is glued fairly well here, so I'm just going to take some vinegar and put it in here. Let that work its way into the joint, and that should loosen up the glue. The other way to do this is with heat, but vinegar is the safest way to do this without damaging the wood. It's now been about five minutes, and I'm trying to pull up some of what's here. You see it's loosening up some of the glue. This looks like it might be PVA glue. So what I want to do is just work my scraper into the groove here and expose that crack to the vinegar so I can get it further in there. So that's happened sometimes with chair joints like this where the glue excess glue was just left residue. need to work that in. So add more vinegar and let it sit. I'll do the same thing with this part here. If you watch down here, what I'm going to do is wiggle the back and you'll see that there's some movement. So it's opening and closing on this part here, but it's not here. So I need to continue to work vinegar into that joint to get it to loosen up. As I continue to work through this and pull the glue off, I notice that it's really sticky. And that tells me that this is actually hide glue, which is perfect because it will fully reverse and I'll be able to get this joint undone without damaging it. I can now move this and you can see at the front and the back, we've got some movement. That's perfect, we're ready for the next step. So let's see if I can ease this out with a spreader clamp. It doesn't often work with a spreader clamp. Let's see. I see a little bit of movement, but not much. So a soft piece of dowel. You don't want this to damage the wood, so you want it to be softer than the wood in the chair. And what this does, it just loosens it up a little bit. So this one's pretty free. I'll just continue to tap this out. And then we'll get the back off. There we go. Now I'll check these spindles here. These are tight, these are tight. So when we've got pieces like this that are tight, no need to take them off. What I'll do is clean off the joints here, prep them for regluing. We've got to put wedges in here when we put it back together and I'll show you that step, but I'll take apart the rest of this chair and then we'll get to turning the new stretcher. Now this is a very simple straight turning. And you might ask yourself, why wouldn't you just use a dowel to replace this? Well, I'll show you. This is a dowel from the hardware store. It's sold as hardwood but watch it flex. So this is made out of poplar, which is the softest of hardwoods. So it's not something that's furniture grade. If you might have some old furniture parts around, that are much stiffer. You might be able to refinish it and use it here. Um, but for this particular project, I'm gonna be using the lathe. Now I've got the distance here that I need between the stretchers. So I need a bit of a tenon on each end. I'll make it a little extra long and I'll just fit it in here. So what we're doing is just really creating a dowel on the lathe. I'll put these dowels back and then look at my wood supply here for a piece of birch. So it's a good quality hardwood. Here's a piece here. I'll just rip that down 
we can turn that. The first step is to find the center of this on either end. So use a center finder here and a pencil. And as I go around this, it gives me the center of the rough stock. Now, this is a spur drive and that's what turns the piece of wood. Mine has four teeth on it. So I just cut a shallow line on the X here, punch a hole in the middle and this end is ready. Punch a hole in the other end and we're ready to go. I now take the spur drive and put it in those grooves that I created with the saw. I'll give it a few taps with a hammer. And now I can mount that in the lathe. The lathe and dust collection system is all set to go here. But what I want to do is sort of take away the intimidation factor of turning. The idea of turning, some people are afraid of because you think about putting a chisel in and it flies back at you. But there's actually a process you use when you learn turning that that won't happen. So if you look at, for example, what happens with a chisel. If I were to take this chisel and try to plane off a piece of wood here, it's going to want to dig in. And the way we use a plane is actually it has a front and a back to the plane where the blade is. This is a shoulder plane and I pulled this out so you can see the cutting edge here. So there's a front and a back to a plane and these two surfaces prevent that cutting edge from digging in. So as I go across here, the plane can do a shaving without digging into the wood. The lathe behaves in a similar way. On the back of the plane is where the tool rest is. So that's where the chisel comes down. And then on the front of the plane, that's where you've got the bevel. And I'll show you that up close. We'll use the parting tool as an example because it has the largest bevel possible. So just to illustrate this, when I come down here, what I want to do is put the bevel down. And then as I slowly bring it back this way, I want to engage the cut. So this piece is turning this way towards the chisel. So as I start to take a little bit of the cut on the top, the bevel down here is still supported on the piece of wood. So this is what's controlling the depth of the cut. So when I start up the lathe, I put the bevel on here, pull it back here until it starts to engage. The process of learning this is ABC. So it's anchor your chisel on the tool rest, ride the bevel until you engage the cut. So anchor, bevel, and then cut. You follow those rules, you'll be safe. If you don't want to do a turning, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this without uh, making the tenons narrower. So I'm just going to have a dowel. And that way, if you do have someone making a dowel for you, I'll show you how you fit this in the chair. So I'm just doing a straight dowel here. I'll turn on the lathe, turn on the dust collector, and we'll get going.
The turning is all sanded, so I can take this off the lathe now, but I just wanted to show you this prototype I'm creating for a dust collection system for the lathe. You can see how little dust is left here. Typically, you'd have a pile of dust on this. So if you want to learn more about this, you can go to the Clean Lathe YouTube channel. I can lay out my part now, so what I want to do is just center this, and then I'm going to mark here where the tenons start to go into the chair leg this way. So here. Now, if I take calipers and I put them in the mortise, this will tell me how deep that hole is. So that's how long the tenon should be, minus a little bit of room. So if I cut this off here, I'll have a little bit of room in case there's glue squeeze out. I don't want to make it as long as the mortise because that could cause some troubles when I do the glue up. The easiest way to cut this is with something called a bench hook. It's just a board here and another one here. So I'll move this padding out of the way. And what it does is it just sits here snug against the bench top. I'll get it with my saw and cut that off. This is a dovetail saw. The way to hold it is with your finger out here. You got better control. And because it's a Western style saw, that means it cuts on the push. And that's why a bench hook is so good here. I don't need to clamp this down. I've just got pressure working in my favor. back into view this is the mortise here that I want this to fit in and it's too wide I knew that so this is a line here that I drew earlier what I'm going to do is take a knife and I'm just going to pare it down a little bit at a time so I take a sweeping cut here so I'm pushing down and then sweeping out pushing down and then sweeping out and that gives me the start of a shoulder and I can then work my way all the way around and then out here it's just a matter of shaving off the same amount all the way around and we'll give it a try okay we'll give it a try it's almost there not quite so just a little bit more okay we'll try it again here it's almost there so from here I'm just going to take 120 sandpaper sand it off a little bit get a nice snug fit Okay, nice snug fit. I'll trim the tenon on this side of the stretcher the same way, and then I'll drill out these broken parts, and I can glue up the chair. Before I drill this out, I just want to show this to you once more. So this is how this was repaired. It looks good from the outside, but it didn't have any strength. So if you look at the end of the stretcher here that broke off, there isn't a whole lot of material there to begin with. But when you drill it out to put a dowel in, you're left with just a really small outer piece here, and that's why this failed. I'll show you another example of this. This is one from a chair. This was a chair back. And here you can see there was a hole that was drilled and a dowel put in, and that just weakened that piece. I've got one more example I'll pull out in the workbench after I get this glued together. I've cleaned off all the joints and prepared them for the glue, but right here I've got this split. The split along the seat here isn't moving at all, so I can't glue it up anymore. So what I'll do is fill that in. I'll use burn-in wood filler. I'll do that after I get this glued up though. The back of this chair is held on by what's called a through mortise. So this goes all the way through the chair, and a wedge goes in to hold the chair back on. This I just need to clean out any of the old wedge that was in here and any residue to make way for the new wedge. 
This is a chair back wedge. We sell them on our website. And what you need to do is put it in the slot and figure out where that friction starts. And that's where you cut it off. And I've already cut this one. And you can see here, I can put it in. And as I drive this in, it will spread that apart. We'll make sure the back of the chair is nice and secure. So as always, I'm using hide glue to put this back together because it's a reversible glue. That way this can get repaired in the future. So I'll glue up all the parts here. I will put the back in, flip it over, and I'll show you how the wedges go in. So I'll turn this upside down here and you can see this is where the wedge is going to go. But what I want to do is make sure I've got a really tight fit here. So I'll grab a clamp, put it on the back here and just pull that as tight as I can to seat that joint. You see how that popped up there? I'll do the same on the other side and then I can drive the wedge in. So with the wedge, I put glue on one side and that'll just help keep it in place, but I don't put glue on both sides. It's a lot easier to take out if you have to, if there's only glue on one side. So the trick here is to hold the back so you're not holding on to the base here. Hold the back so that as you're driving this in, you're not knocking it apart. So just lift it up a little bit off the bench. And you hear that sound change as it goes in. That's applying pressure here. And that's why these chairs won't come apart if they're wedged properly. So I can take these clamps off now. And while the glue is still wet, what I want... Oh, shoot. I missed those pieces. Oh. That's a problem. Use a flush cut saw here just to trim these up. And then what I can do is turn it over and then we can put the legs on. The 
Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. It's just four mortises, four tenons. And I'll stain this piece after I put it together. You can try and pre-stain it, but I find just in practice, it's more difficult to get the color right. And it's just more efficient to do it this way. Also, you want to make sure you're not getting any finish on the tenons because if you get finished on the tenons, your joints aren't going to stay together. So I find this is just the easiest way to do it, is put the finish on afterwards. So now this has to be put in in the right orientation, so it goes this way. And these go on like this. Okay. Now we can glue this to the bottom of the chair. And we're good to go. It's a little awkward with this clamp here. But back legs are going first because they're splayed. And once they're in, then the front legs can go in. just to add some weight to the seat and that'll provide some clamping pressure. Hmm. <laughs> there we go. Well with everything clamped up here I'm going to slide it out of the way and what I want to do is show you another rocking chair that has a problem where the part's been mended as well with a dowel. So in this rocking chair, the back has snapped off here. This post here is broken. Now it's a really unique chair in that it operates on a spring. Now I've never seen one like this before. I don't know if I ever will. I think there's a bit of a design flaw here though, because what you're doing is to get it to rock, you're always putting tension on this back. This has been repaired a number of times. It's really been butchered, so it's gonna be challenging to fix. But let's take a look at this post here that someone tried to repair. So you can see here, this has been drilled out. If I put my finger in there, it's about an inch deep and you can hear it. It sounds rather fragile. So this is a technique that I used to think was a good repair technique until I started seeing these. I used to have a video on YouTube teaching how to do this, but I realized it's not the right thing to do. And I'll explain why. So here's the tenon that's broken off here. You can see what the tenon should look like on the matching leg. And that gets the glue in there. Oh, and you can see that, that front gave way which is fine. So as long as I'm down to my line, I know I'm good to go. After about 20 minutes of filing and sanding, I've now got this in shape that it's a nice snug fit in the hole and it's all ready for glue. I've taken that YouTube video down because I've seen a number of pieces break. Now, it seems logical that if I'm putting a dowel on here, it's going to have some strength. So when you glue two pieces of wood side grain to side grain, that bonds very well and it's very strong. If it's glued right, it'll be stronger than the wood fibers itself. But if you try to glue two pieces end to end, there's no strength there. 
This, the wood grain is like a series of straws. And if you try to glue ends of straws together to ends of straws, they just don't hold. They need to be side by side so that they can bond. What's happening here is I've drilled a hole in there and that wood, that new dowel I'm putting in, it's connecting side grain to side grain. So that's strength. The problem is at the bottom of the hole, we've got this going on. So while I'm strengthening a part here, I'm actually creating a weakness where those two pieces of wood are connecting. So this is something you shouldn't be doing, whether it's a piece like this, a post on a chair, or whether you're using a stretcher and deciding to put a dowel in there to just sort of mend it, it's not going to have the strength that it should in a piece of furniture. So I hope that helps you understand that. Let's take the clamps off this and we'll get to staining. I'm using acrylic stains for this and I think I'll use an antique walnut. That color should get pretty close. Now I can use these stains on the scrap piece that I've got here and see what it looks like. Yeah, that's pretty close. So the nice thing about using acrylic stains is there's no smell to them, they're non-toxic. So they go on really easily. And if you make some sort of mistake and you think, no, nope, that's not the right color, they wipe off pretty easily as well. So I'm just going to apply this across the whole piece, let it penetrate. But you can see here how I can dial in the color and get it looking like the other piece. So it probably will need a, a second coat just to get it to the depth that I need. And I'm going to finish it off with shellac. So these are the two easiest finishing processes you can use. This is a newer technology, something that will eventually, I believe, take over the industry. Just because it is easy to use, non-toxic, I really don't see a drawback in using it. So the first coat here is a little bit light. What I'm going to do now is go over it with some dark walnut. Use a different technique. So I'm just putting the stain on first. And what I'll do is come back and wipe it off. So I've got lots of coverage there. Do the same thing on the bottom. Not now. Just wipe off the excess and get it the shade I need to match the chair. The stain is dry now, so I'm just going to use some paper here just to rub it down. This is just a very, very mild abrasive. This will just smooth out any potential bumps that are there. Okay, that's good. And then I'm using garnet shellac. So I just add this to the brush. I'm working on such a small space here. I'll just saturate the brush. And then I can put it on. I'll put on a couple coats of shellac, but between the drying time, it really only takes about 10-15 minutes, I'll put in the burn-in wood filler. So this is a wax wood filler that you just use a hot soldering iron. Um, if you use one that's plugged in, it's going to be too hot. A battery operated one works perfectly for this. The process really is pretty simple. It's just adding the right colored wax, letting it dry for a few seconds, and then scraping it off with a sharp plastic razor blade. The trick to this of course is matching the color and it's something that really just takes practice. Uh, some people don't have an eye for it. Uh, if you do have an eye for it, it comes pretty naturally. Being able to see what color you need and then just blending in the colors to get precisely the color that's going to blend in.
On the top of the seat here, it's much more difficult to match something. There's a variety of colors going on here, so I'm going to do the best that I can. If you don't have an eye for color, it is something that you can learn. I had Bob walk up on fixing furniture and he showed how to match stain and it took him a while when he was learning to do this to actually get the knack for it. Um, understanding the color wheel can be important as well. There's a colors finisher wheel that you can use to help. So I'll show you a little bit here. I'll intentionally put some wrong colors in here and tint them so you can see what that's like. But if you're interested in learning about how to match colors, let me know in the video description. Perhaps that's a course that I can put together for you. So here's a variety of fill stick colors that I have here and you can see some of them look a little bit more red. Some of them look much more blonde and white. So what I need to do is pick something in here that's going to match over here. I think this one's probably going to be the closest based on what I'm seeing with my eye, but let's intentionally do something a little different. Let's go with this one that's a little bit lighter and see how that works. So you can see there are a couple different colors across here. It's a little darker here and here. It's a little bit lighter there. So there's going to be a variety across here. If I just fill it with a solid color, it's going to be very noticeable. So let's put this first color in here and see what it looks like. So the soldering iron just needs a few seconds to heat up. And then we can put the color in. And then I'll come back with the plastic razor blade. Scrape that off. So you see how noticeable that is? So it's a little bit off. Let's grab this one. What I'll do is add it in the front here. Actually, I'll add it to the back where it's a little bit darker. And just see how that works. So that's looking not too bad. Now, one thing that wood fill can't do is give you chatoyance. And that's when you look at the wood from one angle versus a different angle, wood actually has a slightly different color. And wood filler can't do that. It's just one solid color. So I'll rotate this a little bit. You see how that looks a little bit different? So, um, Wood filler is not perfect, but by being able to blend these in, you can get it pretty close. So I'm going to just take a little bit of this out. And you can blend these colors together to get a custom color that you're looking for. I'll add this in here. And I'm going to start with this as my base color, and then I'll shift it depending on where I need it on the seat. With this all filled in, you can see down here, it's matching pretty well. But when it gets to this point here, all of a sudden it looks dark. That's all the same color. So what I need to do is apply a lighter color here, blend it in with the fill I've already got there, and hopefully we can get that to disappear. So there you go, the line is right here, and then it's blended in pretty well. I did take a little bit of the finish off here, so I'll just touch that up with shellac, and we'll be all done. I put the second coat of garnet shellac on the replacement stretcher here. Take a look, and let me know what you think. And here's what it looks like compared to the original stretcher. Now this handsome little rocking chair will go back to the very proud grandparents that brought it to us. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned a few new things. If you'd like to learn more about what not to do for furniture repair, I'll leave you a playlist right here. We've got a number of videos there that can help you learn more about furniture repair. Thanks for watching Fixing Furniture. <laughs>